Well, we're here today to talk about our new report, Open for Unconstitutional Business Municipal Prayers in Ontario. I'm Ian Bushfield, Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association, and I'm joined by Teal. Hi, I'm Teal Phelps Bondaroff, Research Coordinator for the BCHA. And Olivia. Hello, everyone. I'm the Policy Analyst for the BCHA. So we released this report a week ago. It's massive. There's so much in here. We have a lot of discussion to bring you today. Before I really get into that, I just have to do my job and beg you for money. We are in our year-end fundraising campaign. We're doing pretty well, but we need more money to keep doing this kind of research in the next year and to really turn it into action. So go to bchumanist.ca slash donate2022 and chip in a few bucks to help make more content like this possible. And with that business out of the way, Teal, maybe I'll ask you, because you've been involved in this project as long as I have and are kind of the driving force behind this, walk us through a little bit of the background of how we got to looking at municipal prayers in Ontario. Great. So, yeah, I've been passionate about legislative prayer for many years. And by passionate, I mean... Um, I don't like it. It's not okay. Um, and so the BCHA has been looking at prayer at uh, political meetings for many years. We've done lots of work on prayer at legislative councils. But uh, recently we looked at prayers in British Columbia municipalities. And this started after we got reports that a bunch of municipalities opened their 2018 inaugural meetings with prayers. And we did a deep dive in our study, a Duty of Neutrality Beyond Saguenay. And in that, we found that 23 municipalities in BC opened their 2018 inaugural meetings with prayer. And um, so that was sort of the first step. And then we kind of had a, you know, not time on our hands, but a passion for the issue. And so we looked across the entire country and we've been going province by province and looking for a legislative prayer at municipal council meetings. Our most recent report before this one was in open defiance, where we looked at um, municipalities in Manitoba, where we found six municipalities had prayers in their inaugural meetings. Um, but also four municipalities had prayers in their regular council meetings. And so we're slowly working our way across the country, um, covering all the provinces. And this most recent report covers Ontario. That's great. And so, Olivia, you joined the project more recently, just this past summer, through our Canada Summer Jobs Grant. We've been able to keep you on because of our amazing donors. I'll just keep pitching that throughout the podcast. You weren't involved in the early aspects of the research, but from... You know, you helped write this report and have gone through every, you know, square inch of it. Can you walk us through a little bit about what exactly it is we did to find out what prayers are involved in Ontario? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been a super interesting project to begin on with my work here. Um, so essentially, it was taking a whole bunch of data of minutes and agendas and YouTube videos or really janky um, <laughs> municipality videos on their lovely video um, I don't know, systems, I guess. Um, I didn't collect the data myself, so I'm not going to take credit for that. But we had to go through all this lovely data that uh, um, some of your past researchers collected and basically compile it. Um, the number kept getting bigger and bigger <laughs> as I was going through, which was uh, slightly disheartening, but it made this project even more interesting. Um, so yeah, it was reading a lot of prayers, watching a lot of YouTube videos of pastors and community members giving very <laughs> Christian and crazy uh, prayers. Um, and then, yeah, making massive tables <laughs> with all of the data. Um, yeah, it was it was really interesting um, to and, and what we to did see all of that oh, oh, come together. Oh, so Olivia's just mentioning the sheer volume of data we had. So when we looked at BC, we only had about 162 municipalities, uh, but for Ontario, there's thousands of them. So we limited ourselves to municipalities with populations of over a thousand, and that gave us what was it, the 360 municipalities. And so that was sort of a way of, of limiting our, our scope because otherwise we were going to start looking at some very small municipalities. And Olivia's not wrong. Some of the websites, when the population of your town gets small, uh, the budget you have for producing a quality website goes down um, and it makes it very uh, challenging to navigate, to say the least. I think we'd initially considered just doing the top 50 in each province. And 
we were finding so many violations that we realized we needed to look a bit further and look a bit wider. And I think that was really valuable. Like it was a lot of work to clean up all of our data right at the end and make sure we knew what everyone was doing. And we felt confident about saying what they were doing because we've been yelled at before. When we released the Manitoba report, we had the mayor of one of the small towns calling us like the day before the release going, we don't pray. I'm, you know, we're all atheists in this town. I was like, all right, we'll go back through and look at what you did. And we'll go, oh, all right, fine. You called it an invocation. We're going to still call that out, but we won't say you prayed. The invocation was delivered by like the local paleontologist. It seems not religious. And it's hard to figure out what's happening in all of these towns. So Ontario was fascinating for this. Um, even within those 360 municipalities, though, you know, we struggled and we did our best with our team and found data for 328 on inaugural meetings in 2018. We looked at earlier data as well for trying to compare to what happened before Saguenay. We'll get into that in a little bit. But, you know, we found 328 inaugural council minutes and we found 156 of them included invocations or prayers in 2018. That's 47.6%. That's wild teal yeah well and, and it's, it's important to note some like the challenge like the challenges you mentioned are, are very real and so like some of the limitations are that we were specifically looking at the minutes and the agendas of inaugural meetings and then we randomly selected three council meetings after the 2015 Saguenay decision um, but up until the recent day as sort of a sample of regular meetings and that kind of allowed us to see what was going on in the municipal councils but it's possible we missed some prayers so if prayers took place outside of the official agenda um that may or may not be a problem, legally speaking, um, or if they weren't recorded in the agenda or the minutes, right? Some places they're not recorded. So the ones that you were talking about, the 146, 100, um, 100, uh, sorry, the 156 rather, um, is ones that we've confirmed are, are prayers, invocations, and that kind of thing. Um, it's entirely possible that we've missed some as well. And that's a lot, right? And I think it's it's probably a good time to talk about like why you can't do prayers in municipal council meetings. So people who followed our work for many years will know that you know we've been we've been pointing this out. But this isn't just you know our opinion. This is an opinion of the Supreme Court of Canada. So in 2015 in Saguenay, the Supreme Court ruled that you can't open a municipal council meeting with prayer. That the state has a duty of religious neutrality, and as a result, you know you can't just give exclusive space at a meeting to one religion over others or religion over non-religion. And so when we say that you can't have prayer in a municipal council meeting, um, it's not just our opinion, it is the law of the land, it's the constitution. And so it's shocking to know that almost half of the municipalities that we looked at in Ontario had prayer. Um, that's not okay. Yeah, and Supreme Court precedents are often a little tough to work with because they'll deal with the specific facts in a specific scenario. But in this case, they decided to make a very strong ruling. Like Saguenay is very clear that, you know, yes, there might be instances where the state, you know, adopts religious language for traditional, but most of the time that's going to be pretty exclusive. And especially in this case of the city of Saguenay, the mayor was trying to do a prayer in every meeting. They tried to make it non-denominational. It wasn't. Uh, and the Supreme Court said even if it was non-denominational, it would still probably exclude atheists and the non-religious. So just don't do them. We'll get into the depth of like where the fuzziness gets later, but you know, a lot of the prayers we found in Ontario were just overtly religious. Like uh, Olivia, maybe you can talk us through a little bit of what we found on the inaugural meetings, just on like the number side. Yeah. So is that I have to scroll through here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, for Christian prayers, I think it was, well, most of them were, um, hundred, yeah, 90% were Christian or Christian sex. We compiled them all together. So, um, yeah, that was really disappointing actually to see that there was only three that were out of, out of that many were non-Christian. Um, and even though they were non-Christian, they were still um, Abrahamic. So it, there wasn't really a lot of diversity between the prayers, um, even though they're not supposed to be doing them. Um, it would have been nice to see there was a little more diversity because Canada is obviously a very diverse country. Um, yeah, 
it it was really really disheartening to see that um and just going through some of the transcripts you know a lot of jesus's were said a lot of crossing themselves and um please bow your head and i mean it's very overtly christian like it's you know hard hard to debate that it it wasn't um yeah and even with new market where they had like multiple um, people come in to give prayers. It's still, there was still not pretty much diversity there. Um, I think two out of the five are still Christian. So <laughs> they didn't try very hard. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have anything more to say or add to that in terms of the religious aspect, but. I wanted to say something about Newmarket. Um, so Olivia's mentioning Newmarket, and that was an interesting case where they seemed to try harder than other municipalities. So they didn't just have a Christian prayer. They had two Christian prayers, but they also had a, a Jewish prayer, a Muslim prayer, and I believe a Sikh prayer. And uh, so that, or maybe that was Vancouver. Maybe I'm getting the next No, prayer. yeah. Newmarket had, a Christ, uh, had an indigenous open, and then it was followed by a Christian uh, a Muslim, a rabbi, and then another Christian. I believe the last one was a Catholic. Yeah. Right, yeah. So so thinking like, hey, we're going to be super accommodating and we're going to have a space that all these different religions are invited to, which seems super interfaith. But the problem with that is that in creating a space that more religions are welcome, what you're saying is that the non-religion, the, the non-religious are extra not welcome, <laughs> right? So it seems to underscore the, the way that prayer excludes. You're saying, hey, everyone's welcome if you have a religion. Like, all people are allowed to pray in their own way. It excludes people who don't pray or don't have a religion that includes prayer. And so that was one of the things that we thought was kind of, you tried hard, folks, but you actually made it not, you actually made it worse in that case. Uh, and the, the level of religiosity was, was like, shocking. Like, you know, 90.5%, I think it's higher than we had for British Columbia, Ian, if I'm not mistaken. Like, the amount of Christian prayers was... Uh, yeah, it was just a lot of Christian representatives. I mean... Coming back to Newmarket, I spoke with the Newmarket today about this, and they got a quote from the clerk there, Lisa Lyons, who said, uh, it's the town's hope that we continue to build on the diversity of our community that Newmarket serves as an example of what it means to be inclusive of all. And, I mean, there's still no non-religious up there. I mean, I, I told them it's a good intention, but good intentions only take you so far. There needs to be a deeper reflection on this. New, true neutrality doesn't grant privilege to religious or non-religious views, it remains silent. And that's one of the ways you make sure everyone's included. That's the point of Saginay, right? Is that true neutrality isn't about pushing atheism or non-religion over people. It's about just the state not taking a position. And that's what they miss the chance to do here. I mean, I had a long conversation with the journalist there, and we even got into some of the challenges that's raised in this by putting an indigenous perspective on the same stand as the religious ones as though it's not a separate level of government and we have a long discussion that maybe we can get into a little bit later depending on how long this podcast goes on indigenous content but it's in the report definitely read the report but yeah new market was just such a novel example but it was still kind of that failed ecumenicism that we talk about later in the report as well and you were mentioning like the, the challenge with Saguenay was they were reporting they were reciting the lord's prayer at the beginning of every meeting and, you know, when Olivia's talking about the religious, the religiosity of the content we found, we're not talking about like milk toast. Like, yeah, don't get me wrong. There were milk toast prayers that were vaguely secular, but like evoked the divine and the spiritual. We're talking about like actual municipalities that included the Lord's Prayer. Like we found a few that just start with the Lord's Prayer or some of them like we had to, well, we're going to get to the content in a bit, but some of them were like hellfire and brimstone like sermons. And so it wasn't like one of those situations where this is like a nice ecumenical interfaith, interdenominational invocation that everyone can get behind. Um, it, it, it was, you know, it was a hellfire sermon. And I think it's also just worth pointing out, Ian, you were saying, you know, we're trying to accommodate everybody. There are tens of thousands of religions in the world, and it's just not possible for New Market to have enough time, people, resources, or patience to include that many prayers in their inaugural meeting. And then, of course, you know, as we've talked about in other publications, you know, when you look at differences between sects and individual practices of religion, in a sense, you'd have to invite every single resident of New Market to deliver an invocation of their own crafting. Um, and even that would be problematic because some people's religions don't allow them to do public prayer 
or require that certain criteria are met for a prayer to be delivered. So it's just, A, it's not practical to deliver or possible to uh, represent all the religions in a council meeting. And even if it were, it would still discriminate against the non-religious. So the inaugural meetings are ceremonial in nature. We're not, we're disappointed, but not entirely surprised to see invocations get used there because there is still that weighty, let's try to make something special out of this swearing in of the new council. But Olivia, as we mentioned, we already looked, we also looked at regular council meetings. And while we didn't find any prayers in BC and we found a couple in Manitoba, what did we find in Ontario? Yeah, we so we found that nine or 2.5% had prayer in the regular council meetings. Um, but more significantly, we found a lot more moments of silence um, and regular council meetings. So that was kind of an interesting find is that there was more of those in um, the regular council meetings than inaugural. Um, so it seems like there was a bit more of a shift there, although we can't completely claim that because we didn't um, com compile the data for moments of silence as concretely. Um, yeah, so I think it was a regular meeting that they were still having a Lord's Prayer as well. I can't remember exactly. I think it was Laurentine and Valley, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. Um, yeah. So that's obviously not good because Dagny directly says that you can't say the Lord's Prayer in council meetings. Um, yeah, I think it really inter is interesting to see that that shift, though, in the change between um, more moments of silence and um, less prayer. So it seems that Dagny did have an effect on moments of silence. Are we going to have to cut that out? <laughs> Yeah, there there was a lot of diversity in these regular meetings. That the sixty two moments of silence was quite prominent. We can get into that a little bit more. But the nine prayers was also hard to quantify because I think we initially had more prayers or invocations, and then as we dug through them, uh, we found that some of these had stopped or were in the process of stopping or even as we asked them because we did write to every one of these municipalities this past summer that we identified as a violator and said hey there was a supreme court ruling seven years ago that you should probably be aware of and start listening to that actually probably prompted some to change we know uh like the town of russell that we'll talk about changed theirs from a prayer to a reflection although the language of it maintained the same uh Within the nine prayers that still remain, you know, a couple of them, like you said, Laurentian Valley reads the Lord's Prayer every day. Whitewater Region uh, includes a prayer to Almighty God. But then a couple of them are invocations like Brantford's that is very secular and seemingly, seemingly inclusive, but has a weird nomenclature around it, right? They name it weirdly. Mm -hmm. There's also, I think it's Petersboro that, the mayor would specifically say what the moment of silence was for, and it was to reflect on the Constitution, which I thought was interesting. Um, and it, I feel like that's almost better in a way. I mean, there's still maybe elements that could have been prayerish, um, but to directly say what the moment of silence is for, um, which I thought was kind of an interesting take on that. This is something that I was talking about on TikTok the other day, actually, because someone's like, I don't think moments of silence are okay. And it's like, well, actually, the, there's different types of moments of silence. And it sounds really weird to say that. Like, there's different types of silence. But, you know, as you're saying, like, there's prescriptive moments of silence where you tell people what to do in that moment of silence. And then there's just like, hey, let's have a moment to get our head in the game. And saying let's bow our heads and pray silently is still a prayer, right? <laughs> it's still instructing people to pray. It's still using the coercive power of the state to impose one religious view over others. Whereas saying like, let's take a moment to reflect on what we're about to do. All right, let's get governing kind of thing. Um, like what Quebec does in their, um, their, their, their parliamentary, their provincial legislature, um, national assembly that is. So yeah, it's one of those things where there's different types of silence. And we saw that, you know, that sort of stealth prayer aspect of people trying to smuggle prayer in through moments of silence um, and the way they introduce them. Well, and, some moments of silence are secular but might still be objectionable to some for example the township of alnwick 
Haldeman said, we're going to have a moment of silence for our fallen soldiers and citizens. Pacifists, you know, might feel a little uncomfortable there or might want to frame that a little different, not that they don't respect the sacrifices people have made. Uh, the town of Rainy River was beginning with a moment of silence and salute to the queen. Presumably that's to the king now. Uh, the anti-monarchists among us will definitely be offended by that. Uh, and, you know, others used to have a prayer of silent meditation. Uh, that was the town of Fort Francis. But then after February 2020, they had a prayer moment of meditation, but the word prayer was crossed out in the agenda, which was just hilarious to dig up. And that was like two or three agendas in a row before they finally just said moment of meditation going forward. Some evangelical Christians get really offended by having moments of meditation. They think it's imposing like Buddhism on them or Hinduism on them. This is not come across that. This is something that I think is worth highlighting, right? Because one of the questions that people often ask is, you know, in excluding prayer from a council meeting, are you discriminating against the religious, right? And the point that you were just making, Ian, I think really highlights that. Uh, and this is stipulated in Saguenay. I think it's paragraph 148. Um, <laughs> we, can look, we can check the exact paragraph. I don't have them all memorized. But there's a paragraph in Saguenay that says, the opposite of prayer is not no prayer. The opposite of prayer would be starting each meeting with the affirmation that there is no God or gods or that religion is false. And so... You know, the government is not discriminated against the religious by not including prayer in a meeting. You know, by saying you no longer get a special privilege is not discriminating against that group that's losing their special privilege. It's leveling the playing field. And, um, and so, you know, when people get upset about a moment of meditation potentially representing a religion, uh, it kind of really puts, you know, puts into stark contrast the issue that we're talking about, right? If someone feels uncomfortable because there's a religious or pseudo-religious practice at a council meeting, that's making that space less welcoming to them. And it's really important that municipal council meetings are welcoming to everybody, regardless of their religion or lack thereof. So I mentioned that we wrote to all of these municipalities. Uh, we got some great responses. You know, this was a couple hundred emails, and we ended up getting 25 responses. Olivia, can you take us through what people told us in response and highlight some of the funnier answers I guess we got? Yeah, so... I think we got 25 responses out of all the people that we emailed. So kind of a sad number. I wish we got more, <laughs> um, but 25 is good. Um, so seven committed to change, which is a good thing. Um, a lot of them were kind of unclear. Like they're just like, okay, or we'll take this into consideration or something. So we're just kind of like, all right. Um, and then we had six that were in disagreement with us. So um one we can highlight that I think what we all thought was the most interesting was Lambton Shores. Um, I said, I don't know if it was the council or the mayor that responded to us, but I don't know, should I read it out? <laughs> he responded to us by saying, I believe in God and that he has unlimited power at his disposal. As I drive to every council meeting, I pray for God's wisdom and guidance upon it. I recognize the state's duty of religious neutral neutrality. Um, my concern is that in our world today, that too many institutions and leaders have shifted into neutrality and are not realizing their full potential. God is not the enemy, but desires a loving and constructive relationship with us. John 3.16 says it all. Best. David. <laughs> so, yeah, um, there's a lot to unpack there, but quoting the Bible <laughs> is uh, probably not what we were hoping for. We're going to respond. Um, it's pretty clear. That, what... that bit that that's just like, I recognize the state's duty of religious neutrality. I just don't like it. Pretty much. <laughs> well, this one. Yeah. This... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dill. I was going to say, like, that one was, was really bad. Um, one of the ones I liked was, uh, was Collingwood, where, you know, they push back and they're like, where did you get your information from? Like, we don't have prayers in our council meetings. And then we just go and double check. And at their 2018 inaugural meeting, they've got a prayer by the Reverend, the Reverend uh, Donna Wilson from the Erie Saint Community Church, uh, Erie Street Community Church, that is. And she starts with, let's pray, uh, our Father and God. Like, it's, it's interesting that in some of these situations, the religious content is so ingrained that they don't even notice it, right? Now, obviously, they're not starting every meeting in Collingwood with prayer, but including in the inaugural meeting is, is not better. Um, it's often worse because, you know, the as you were saying, Ian, 
the inaugural meeting has these important ceremonial elements. And so when you're underscoring religion, it seems to say it's more important. But I thought that was very interesting when some municipalities didn't even realize that they were praying uh, when we pointed it out. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the, uh, the evangelical pushback is, uh, is pretty intense. That's, uh, that's something special. Yeah. And like I said, we didn't get responses from everyone in our final like sweep of media around this. I did see that the municipality of Kincardine uh, actually amended their procedures bylaw in September 2022, just before their inaugural meeting to eliminate prayers. So it seemed like some of them got the message, but then just like didn't reply to us. Uh, we included all our correspondence in the appendices of the report. It's what helps push it to 177 pages, although it's like 75 pages of core content, which is one of our longest reports ever. The other one really fascinating response, maybe let's talk about this now, is the township of Russell. So they, following our email, changed from a prayer to a reflection. But like I said before, they kept the text of that. Now, the text of that uh, prayer reflection is... Whereas Canada is founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law, let us take a moment of personal reflection. Now, the nerdiest among us will recognize that as the text from the preamble of the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I, this really has the feeling of, hey, you can't sue us for saying the words of the Charter in every meeting, which, is that a loophole? Well, this is this is the god this is the god of the preamble argument that was brought up in Saguenay explicitly, right? So Saguenay dealt with this argument um, in our first report on legislative prayer. Our other, our, our slightly less voluminous report, the House of Prayers study, uh, we explored all the different arguments that are often brought up in defense of legislative prayer, and one of them is that God is mentioned in the preamble of the Charter, and this came up during the Saguenay ruling in the Supreme Court, and the court said no, no, the the reference to God in the preamble of the Charter is the statement of a political theory. It does not make reference to a specific God, um, and it cannot be used to describe Canada as some sort of religious or theistic state. And so, yeah, that's that's really important to underscore, that that argument has been absolutely rejected uh, by the court. And uh, it does seem like something that we discover, what we describe in the report as stealth prayer, right? It's this way of smuggling prayer into meetings that is, I think it was new for us. Um, we didn't see that in some municipalities. Most of them, they pray or they don't pray. Sometimes there's secular invocations that are kind of on the edge, you know, they're kind of hard to tell. Um, but in this case, we had someone who's very obviously trying to sneak prayer into a meeting in a, in a sort of an underhanded, it's not quite, yeah, maybe underhanded is the right way of putting it. But they're trying to smuggle prayer into a meeting um, through, you know, quoting the preamble of the charter. Um, but it's still, there's still prayer, right? You're still asking people to, play, to reflect on a religious content. It's on the edge. Uh, that's all I'll say, I think, at this point. Yeah, we're not lawyers here and i'm sure people could argue it strongly one way or the other i think what we say in the report though is that it's it's not a good faith attempt to include yeah. everyone in the community and it's not a good faith attempt to like abide by the values enshrined in saguenay like if you're a community and you're a mayor who's concerned with representing the religious and the non-religious in your community don't start meetings talking about the supremacy of god simple as that there's something else i wanted to say on this one ian which was you know the nominative change. So here in British Columbia, thanks to our advocacy, which is supported by your generous donations, um, we were able to convince the, uh, the well, we, we played an active role in convincing the provincial legislature to change their practice from prayers to prayers and reflections. So now daily sessions of the BC legislature open with prayers and reflections. This is kind of an improvement, but it kind of underscores a bigger problem, which is you have prayers and reflections. So reflections still come second, and you're still highlighting prayers. Right. If the goal of this moment was to have an honest moment of reflection before you get started, you just call it a reflection, right? But having prayers first necessarily puts a religion, you know, it, it foregrounds religion. And so really it's a nominative change that doesn't have an impact on the actual um, outcome, which is you're highlighting prayer. Now we're studying the, the prayer in the BC legislature to see if it actually changes the content. And it did reduce religiosity a little bit. Um, and we have this in a, another recent publication. But like simply changing what you call it doesn't stop it from being less constitutional, right? It doesn't stop it from not excluding people from the meeting. I'm um, saying we're going to start the meeting with a, with a hug and then going on to praise Jesus. Um, it still is a problem uh, for people who are not religious or from different religions. What if it's a Christian side hug? Uh, we met, you mentioned changes that happened, and I think one of the fundamental changes that did happen was the Saguenay ruling in 2015. And we looked closely at 
that. Like I mentioned, we looked at some of the older data we could find. Uh, similarly, we pulled inaugural meeting minutes from 2010 and 2014, and we tried to compare those to more contemporary data, as well as some older uh, regular council meetings. We didn't find as much there, but Olivia, can you run us through what we did pull out of that interesting data? Yeah, so what we found is that 176 out of 254 included prayers in their inaugural. So this is pre sagne um, and 60 out of 276 included prayers in the regular meetings pre sagne And then we looked at it afterwards from what we could find. Um, and so we found a 59 dropped prayers in their inaugurals um, post Saguenay um, and 63 dropped um, prayers. Yeah, there were some, there were a lot of ones we didn't have data for before Saguenay. So undoubtedly some of those were still praying then or are still praying now. Weirdly, we found three, Russell, Tay Valley and Thorold who didn't have a prayer invocation in 2014 that decided to include it in 2018. But I think the like, takeaway top line thing here is that we saw reductions in the number of prayers go from like 69% in inaugural meetings to 47% and from 25% in regular meetings to 2%, which is just incredible over the years. I also want to add to this that this really underscores the importance of our advocacy. So when we, we looked at British Columbia, we have, uh, you know, in British Columbia, we found 23 2018 inaugural meetings included prayer. Um, and we've been writing letters to municipal councils since that time and doing a lot of advocacy around the issue. And most recently, we only identified three um, in the 2022 municipal um, inaugural uh, meetings. Now, we haven't finished doing that research in detail, and you'll hear more about that in the future. But it really is indicative of, you know, not just the Supreme Court ruling, but the follow-up and advocacy that has a huge impact on changing outcomes. And the other thing you were mentioning, Ian, which is, you know, that some municipalities didn't have prayer and then adopted prayer. A lot of the, the pomp and circumstance around an inaugural meeting really depends on who is in office that term. I was just recently elected to Saanich Council here on Vancouver Island, and you know a lot of the orchestration of the inaugural meeting is just up to the mayor. Like The mayor just says, like, oh, I'd like to invite this person to give the Indigenous welcome, or I'd like to have this drummer drum us in. And uh, so sometimes you, know, you can just ask the mayor, like, hey, you know, the Constitution says you can't have prayer in it. And they're like, oh, great, we won't include prayer. In other situations, they'll invite their favorite pastor because, you know, that's the pastor they grew up with and they want a hellfire sermon. And so I think this is another reason why ongoing advocacy around these issues is really important. It underscores the, the need to remind municipalities that the separation of religion and government is important and that they have a duty of religious neutrality. And that's why I think we've had a lot of success working with city staff in particular, because city staff's obligation is to obviously follow the will of their political count, uh, leaders locally, but also the law. Like municipalities don't have the same level of constitutional rights as provincial or federal governments. And so they're really bound by jurisprudence. And so, you know, a clerk can be told, hey, you should include an invocation, but it's their duty to respond. Okay, but if we do that, we might get sued. And really emphasize, we'll probably lose that lawsuit if you, for example, have your Pentecostal minister give the inaugural meeting in their local church. That just all seems bad. And that did happen. Or it was a reformed church. Well, and I think this is also important, too, because like the non-politicized staff are, are less likely to like plant their flag uh, in the name of their, their religion. And what you actually saw post Saguenay, and this is actually what got us looking into this in the first place, was... Um, a publication by Laurie Beeman, a scholar who studies secularism in Ontario, uh, quoted a couple of mayors after Saguenay saying, you know, I will keep praying no matter what. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I'm going to keep praying. And they're on the record on newspa in newspapers saying, like, you know, Supreme Court be damned. We're going to keep praying. And that's a political choice. And so what it really is important if staff are just like, no, no, we can't do that anymore. You can't open the meeting with, you know, a Fuvazela uh, announcement, nor can you open it with prayer. Let's be reasonable here. So yeah, it's and I think staff has been really reasonable when we reach out to them in most cases. I think most of the weird responses we've received have been from, from councillors and, and mayors. Yeah, and you know, in our research, we also found like advice that came from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario in April 2015, like within a week or two, I think, of the decision being rendered in Saguenay that basically went out to every municipality in Ontario and said, 
while the facts of Saginaw are dependent, uh, the implication is that reciting a prayer in a municipal council chamber will generally breach the duty of neutrality. So if you're doing something like that, you probably want to review your practice and make sure that it's neutral, quote, for both theists and non-theists. Uh, some councils have chosen moments of silence or self-reflection. This is the challenge with trying to demonstrate causality as well. We mentioned this in the report, right? So you've got a statement from, you know, regional organize, or provincial organizations for municipalities. You've got advocacy. You've got a Supreme Court ruling. And we can't exactly say that, you know, Saguenay definitely caused this one municipality to change or our letters to that municipality caused them to change. But we have a pretty strong idea. So just as a, as a note to folks who are listening at home, the, the challenges of demonstrating causality in social sciences are often, uh, you know, are real. I want to turn to some of the content we found uh, because wherever we identified a prayer, we went and tried to transcribe it and had volunteers transcribe all of these prayers. So I think we transcribed like 80 prayers in the end because where we found regular council meetings, we would transcribe three uh, and as many of these inaugurals, though we missed a lot because video technology wasn't widely available. Thankfully, with COVID and all these meetings going online, most of them have live streamed their council meetings. So there's actually a bigger data set for the next time someone wants to do all of this. But maybe, Olivia, what was what was like your favorite or more, most standout content that you read through these transcripts? You know, I put some in our show notes, but you could also pull up the report. And like, what was your favorite thing that you had to read or worst? Oh, my gosh, there's so many. Um, I think the one that made me the most wide eyed was the curse. I was I remember I had to read it like multiple times. I was like, what is this? Um, and you have it pulled up here. Yeah, we literally have a section for curses. So <laughs> um, yeah, this was done in North Bay. Um, and it was Reverend T Dr. Ted Harrison. And he I guess it was the curse of art. Bishop of Dunbar, which I'd never heard before until now. Um, and I'll just read like a section here that we have pulled up. Um, but should this council prove to be cantankerous, uncivil, or unmindful of the task to take care of this land, and especially its most vulnerable inhabitants, I shall be only too pleased to return these to these chambers and share with you the full and unabridged text of the Archbishop Dunbar's curse. Heed my words, my friends, and may holy wisdom guide you in all your decision making. Like, <laughs> are you threatening everyone here? Um, yeah, that that was insane. And then there was another one. I can't remember which now. That was that it was the one done in a church, and uh, having to watch that one was very painful because he went on for about twenty minutes. Um, to straight, to not stop. Um, and even before he started, prompted for everyone to find a Bible in, he didn't say pews, but the, I'm assuming they were pews because they were in a church. Um, yeah, that would also Yeah, that was, West, that was West Lincoln. That was Lincoln, the Canadian yeah. Reformed Church, uh, Reverend Clarence Bowman. I think it's worth naming that municipality specifically here. Mm -hmm. And calling them out. I want to underscore something. I hadn't, so I've been reading the transcripts of these prayers, but I hadn't had the opportunity to listen to a lot of them. And Olivia's been helping, um, helping me upload some of these to TikTok. I listened to the one that Ted Harrison delivered in North Bay. And I want to underscore, first of all, this is like 1500 words, but he did it in an accent. And I, I, I didn't realize that until I listened to the video. But when he quotes the archbishop, he's doing it in a bad accent. So like you're breaking three or four rules of public speaking right there, right? Like don't curse people, don't go on, don't do a quote that's more than three pages long, and like don't do an accent. And I, I really, it was, it was hard listening. And yeah, the the, the services that, that read like sermons are really awkward as well. I think the one that Olivia you were mentioning, the really long one, you can see the orchestra like nodding off in the front row as well. Like it's there was like a band that played O Canada, and these are you know, really not making these spaces inviting to people, uh, even people of those religions, quite frankly. No one wants to sit through an 11 and a half minute sermon before they then have to watch counselors repeat the same, uh, you know, oath of office 10 times. <laughs> well, and those are the ones where there was just one 
sermon, as far as we could tell, delivered. We found multiple examples, seven examples, where multiple prayers were delivered at the same inaugural meeting. They would have an opening prayer and a closing prayer. They would have an opening prayer, an invocation, a inspirational reading that just happened to be from the Bible, uh, and a benediction to just really emphasize this is a Christian space right now. And we dig into this in the report and discuss it in deep, in depth, because it's this big question of, you know, whose space is it in if the entire thing is structured like a religious sermon? Uh, Fort Erie was possibly the worst for this because their whole event was emceed by a United Church minister who then invited two other Christian Protestant ministers to deliver an invocation and a dedication, and she delivered her own prayer at the end. It's a religious service at that point with some civil, you know, duties attached to it. And, and it's important to underscore here, too, that, you know, the example that Ian just made is one of, like, an extreme case. But even if the meeting just starts with the sort of a humble, you know, vague prayer, um, that's still a problem, right? But, yeah, like, you were talking about, in basically, the government becoming theocracy. And, and one of the things I wanted to highlight was that, you know, some of these, these, uh, these prayers were actually prayers for theocracy, so you know, here you have an inaugural meeting, and these generally follow the uh, the election, and they tend to include a swearing in of new officers of the mayor. They tend to have you know, drummers or piping, O Canada, sometimes territorial acknowledgments. We'll speak about those. And that's it. They're usually ceremonial um, practices. And so it's really extra strange that you'd have people coming up and giving prayers that don't thank the electorate for putting people in office, but instead talk about people being in office because of the will of God. Um, and I found that particularly uh, trying, especially when we see the rise of theocracy around the world. You know, and just for example, so you have you know, people, multiple people, uh, and these are priests, by the way, um, quoting Romans 13.1, which says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. And, and so basically, you know, they're insinuating or they're you know, basically stating that people are in office not because of the electorate, but because of God. And that's worrisome. It's, you know, hard to follow that, right? That is such an intense quote, and we saw it multiple times. I guess it was one of the favorite passages because people go, oh, it talks about government, and it talks about God, and they don't actually connect how problematic that is for people who aren't of the same faith. Um, you know, we saw a lot of that kind of language. We mentioned the use of Lord's Prayer in Laurentian Valley. Uh, Clarence Rockland has a bilingual prayer that starts in Notre Père, which is our father in French. It's also the name of the Lord's Prayer in French. We found 10 prayers that ended with, in Jesus' name, specifically, and lots of inclusion of Jesus across the entire use of it. Uh, one of the other things we really came across, and because you watched some of these, Olivia, maybe you could speak to this, is the coercion, coercive elements that worked into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there was a lot that um, maybe didn't start with that specifically, like quoting Jesus or the Bible, but they would either be asked, please stand with me, please bow your head. Um, and this we found across prayers and also moments of silence, I have to add in. So, and that was kind of the most problematic, one of the most problematic elements that we found with that which we were like, okay, so moment of silence or prayer. Um, but yeah, um, even add token silent prayer. <laughs> like, okay, so that's almost like a, a hybrid of both. Um, it implies that, you know, this is a time, time for prayer. It's not a time for a moment of silence or to think about, you know, your duty as a, a counselor or the mayor or whatnot. Um, and it really implies that that space is for Christians or for believers, um, even when you're not specifically quoting Jesus or the Bible. But Teal, don't people have the ability to just not take part? This is totally one of the arguments that's often raised, right? It's saying, okay, so people are going to pray. You don't have to participate. You can exclude yourself or you can just sit there quietly on your hands and suffer through an 11 and a half minute sermon. And this has been tested in the courts, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of, I think it's Zil Zilderberg, and that was a case revolving, um, involving prayer in schools. And the question was, okay, can we pray in classrooms if the non-religious kids can just leave the classroom or just not participate? And 
the court said no, it doesn't work. And they actually said, you know, explicitly, like, on the contrary, the exemption provision imposes a penalty on pupils from religious minorities who utilize it by stigmatizing them as nonconformists and setting them apart from their religious fellows um, who are members of the dominant religion. So basically saying, like, everyone can pray, and if you don't want to, Bob, uh, go wait in the hallway, is stigmatizing and excluding. And, and this is actually also came up during uh, Saguenay. You know, the mayor said, if you're uncomfortable with prayer, just don't show up for the first two minutes. And that's not okay, right? Uh, requiring people to act differently in order to become welcome in a space, it, it's not okay. And also, it just doesn't make them feel welcome in that space. And uh, so those people who are thinking, oh, no, we can accommodate folks and we can be inclusive by simply asking folks to exclude themselves from this portion of the service, uh, sorry, this portion of the municipal council meeting, uh, it's just not the case. And it definitely excludes people. Yeah. And I think one of the municipalities I watched the regular prayer, it might have been Laurentian Valley where they're doing the Lord's Prayer. Every council member read it. All, you could hear them all read it along. And that, and if you're the one counselor who's not a Protestant Christian who identifies with that, or you're the one secularist on that council, or your staff who is required to be there as part of your job, like that imposes such pressure on you to conform. Uh, it's stigmatizing and, you know, it's, it undermines your human rights and your ability to be unequal in that space. Well, and if you look at places like the United States, where the number of out atheists that are in uh, their elected offices, I don't know the number off the top of my head, Ian, but I'm sure it's under 10. Um, and where, you know, declaring and identifying yourself as a non-believer will hurt you at the polls. Um, so suddenly, not only, you know, you're asking someone to say not rise during a prayer or not move their mouth during the recitation of the Lord's Prayer, there's consequences for their job as well. We're not just talking about staff, we're talking about elected officials. And the other thing too is this gives the illusion that everyone is supporting this practice, but in reality, many people may not, but they may just be going along with it because of the social pressures involved. Well, let's maybe jump ahead to some of the attempts to be a little more inclusive. There are a lot of progressive mayors who are elected or progressive town councils who recognize that, all right, reading the Lord's Prayer or doing the prayer in the church is probably wrong, but we want to have some diversity. So we want to recognize all the faiths. Can you run through some of the, those examples that we found, Olivia? And maybe then we can speak to our problems with those. Yeah, so we found quite a few of those. Um, and I guess the main thing here is that even if you're trying to be non-denominational, you're still always excluding atheists. Um, some examples here are Burlington, um, God of many names, God of all creation, we thank you for this day, for many blessings we have received, um, or Aurelia. Um, Respecting all faiths and beliefs, I pray these things in the name of one I serve, Jesus Christ, um, which <laughs> is really ironic <laughs> because still ending that in Jesus Christ um, or a sogging chores. I mean, obviously, if they're reading the Lord's Prayer, that's veiled ecumenicism, but respecting all faiths and beliefs and traditions and attendance tonight, I pray this in the name the one I serve in Jesus's name. I mean, <laughs> just to say you're respecting all faiths and then to end that in Jesus's name is just, why even say that at that point? Um, which he, church in Stouffville, sorry to any of these people who are from these places that I'm butchering the name of your municipality. Um, in 2-1 Community Church, also just have to highlight that instead of spelling two, it's the number two, um, which we thought was kind of a hilarious name for a church. Throw back to... T tell me your Protestant denomination was started in the 1990s yeah. without telling me. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Reverend Graham Clinton began by asking, when I was originally asked to do this, there was the indication that it would be more than a prayer. I, I just want to look for consultation. Is that... So he's basically asking for permission, like in the middle of the ceremony, if you can still pray, like, why don't we talk about this beforehand or uh, uh, check the constitution. Um, thank you. I just want to make sure that we don't do anything out of line. <laughs> so, um, but too late for that. Uh, his prayer 
was oh yeah so that was also a very long one um his prayer was 1176 words that ended in lord jesus lord jesus you are the sovereign that all other leaders fall under so i don't think he was trying to be too careful there <laughs> It's interesting, though, that, you know, here's someone who's kind of acknowledging that this may or may not be appropriate in the, sa in the space, but then they just press on ahead. And yeah, the, the failed ecumenicism always makes me chuckle because you have this example of someone trying to be like, oh, all people are welcome here. Let's talk about my God. And it, it came up like time and time again. And it also just underscores the fact that you can't have an inclusive prayer. No matter what kind of prayer you have, it's going to exclude people, even within Christian sects. Right. So ending a prayer and say in Jesus name might be a practice exclusive to a certain number of sects um, in Christianity um, and not others. And one of the things that Ian and I have talked about in other publications is tiny terms and differences in word choice can indicate a sect preference. So even assuming that this was a Christian nation, having a prayer at a municipal council meeting would still be problematic because you'd be endorsing baptism over Anabaptism or Anabaptists rather or you know Catholicism over Mormonism. And, and so the state gets into really murky waters when it tries to adjudicate these disputes, you know, whether the Eucharist is a, oh, I can't think of it, pre or we pre or post rapture, uh, you know, country. These things become incredibly complicated and impossible for the state to adjudicate. And we can see, you know, pastors and priests uh, failing here, trying to be inclusive, but just not <laughs> just missing the mark. We saw a couple other examples. Hamilton was quite notable for its regular prayers. Now their practice paused during the pandemic and we're not clear if it will start up again, but their practice was to have a form on their website where members of the public, generally clergy could say, I want to deliver the next invocation, which then I guess is their attempt to be diverse and inclusive because anyone can apply to come and give the prayer. Now, we only looked at three, but we found two Christians and I think a Buddhist who gave, which is more diverse than generally across the province. But, you know, this mirrors what we looked at in the BC legislature where individual MLAs can give a prayer or reflection now, or the city of Winnipeg where they rotate which counselor gives the prayer. Um, but it's still a largely theistic practice and also excludes any religions that don't practice proselytization or public prayer. Uh, we saw just recently the Port Alberni case that we've talked about before where a smudging ceremony was done in school and was controversial over that. A court of appeal ruling came down where the indigenous experts who spoke to the court emphasized that in their view, it's not a religious practice when it's done in public. It's more of a demonstration. Their religion is deeply personal and they do it in private. And so that kind of highlights that these practices don't all fit. We have what is basically a Christian hegemonic practice, and we've explored this in a couple of our other reports, that is now trying to include things that don't fit. And so it's forcing non-Christians and non-believers to fit, as Teal has written, you know, a secular peg in a religion-shaped hole. And, and I want to underscore this too, Ian. I think it's important to note, you know, some religious, some religious and religions and faith traditions do not have public prayer as a practice and and or their prayers can't be delivered in a, in a public space so you know some religious traditions have taboos against women being present or participating in the prayer or require a certain number of men so for example in in some jewish sects you know you have to have a minyan a certain number of, of jewish men present in order to have a proper prayer um, those prayers can't be delivered in a municipal council meeting. The municipal council building may not be facing the right direction. There may be the wrong folks there, not the right people there. And so those groups will always be excluded. And so what we see is legislative prayer is very much a Christian practice and other religions, um, as, as Lori Beeman has written, are treated as guests in that space. And that's not a welcoming setting at all. Uh, it's, you know, we congratulations, we cleared a space at the table for you. Welcome to our religious table. Um, that's not welcoming. That's not a state that's being neutral. One of the things I was really, I really enjoyed getting into in this report, and it's something I think we added that we haven't discussed before, is this idea I framed around the, you know, famous Marshall McClellan quote, the medium is the message, that we found several examples of religious clergy giving prayers that were secular. They were like, you read the prayer and it was like, there was nothing religious. They didn't say the word God. 
we found one example, the Southwest Middlesex staff told us they told the Reverend that, quote, prayers and religious overtones are not permissible at council meetings, but they still invited a Reverend, which kind of drives home this idea that once you've structured something in that religious framework, that it, it's an invocation and we're inviting a reverend, but we're telling that reverend not to do religious stuff. It's like, well, you're still doing a prayer. You're still highlighting that religion is dominant in this society. Uh, did you have any takeaways around that, Olivia? Yeah, I mean, I just think if you're trying to be secular or you're trying not to show favoritism, you can't have a religious figure figure being the one giving any of those statements that just still put an air of importance around a particular religion when you do that. So there's just no way to still be non-denominational and yeah, have a religious figure giving, giving the statement it just doesn't work. And I think the best kind of counterpoint to that is the other examples we found that were more truly secular in nature like we found an example of a place where the inaugural invocation was delivered by the senior of the year they just found a beloved old person to come and talk uh, another place had a staff member from the local credit union i mean cool <laughs> a couple others uh opened up their regular meetings with uh, the town vision being read. Very boring stuff. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was about to say the town vision thing. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> I just, I think it's always fun when, you know, we're going to start every meeting with reading our vision statement is the first time you do it is exciting. And then the 300th time it becomes very dry very quickly. I think that one was, was that Hawkesbury that opened with the um, official vision in both French and English. So we're getting that every single meeting, uh, which is interesting because it does beg the question of like, what else could you open a meeting with? And, you know, you could open the meeting with other things, right? You could open it with a moment of silent reflection. One thing we talk about later in the report is Indigenous uh, territorial acknowledgements, or um, my municipality starts with an inclusion statement, literally saying everyone is welcome here regardless of who you are. Um, and so there's other ways of starting a meeting that are way more inclusive. And yeah, the person who's delivering it is, is critical. And yeah, this is also speaks to some of the potential um, areas where we missed, right? Or potential sources of error, which is it's entirely possible that a meeting starts with a prayer that it's just not in the agenda um, or an agenda item that's identified as like call to order also includes the Lord's prayer for all we know. Uh, we didn't listen to every single meeting uh, on uh, or all the different video uh, <laughs> uploads that would have probably driven us mad. The, uh, the very bad websites was enough to drive one to distraction as it was. I did like that the town of Petrolia included an inspirational message read by a different counselor every meeting. One example I found was someone reading a quote from Mary Curie. And that was included in the minutes, which made it actually a lot more useful for data analysis. Uh, the town of Ajax had a community greeting at its inaugural meeting. I couldn't figure out who it was, so I think it was just a random citizen. Last time in 2014, it was a representative of a Hindu uh, temple. Uh, and previously, it was actually a prayer. And so they have tried to make it more inclusive. So, you know, there are practices that we discovered that we're not opposed to necessarily. They're interesting. We don't have a preference. There's a lot of different ways a democratic body can choose to open its meeting if it chooses and wants to have that solemnity. But you know what we identified here, I think, is that a lot of these are steeped still in Christian hegemony. And so that's the thing that we really want to drive home. Well-meaning municipalities still need to be careful of. I think I want to underscore here too something else, which is, you know, starting a meeting with a inspir inspirational quote, for example, it still taps into sort of some religious practices, right? And it's just really, it's really difficult to parse this distinction, distinction between culture and religion. At some point, the idea of starting a meeting with a prayer was just, you know, a no, no brainer for, you know, Christendom, as it were. Um, and now we've moved on to starting meetings with maybe an inspirational quote from Mary Curry. But of course, what is the origin of that practice? Now, it's really difficult to say, and as, as Ian, you were saying, it doesn't necessarily exclude people, but it is interesting to talk about. But what often does exclude people is these sort of efforts to smuggle prayer in under the guise of, say, an inspirational message. So, you know, if you have an inspirational message and someone comes to one council meeting and that inspirational message is from Jesus, um, they might perceive that as being a prayer. 
so it's it's also very important that if you're having these elements, they don't appear to be religious because the state has a duty of religious neutrality. But that also presents a challenge to country, uh, municipalities because if you say, yeah, well, everyone can submit an inspirational message and they get spammed with inspirational messages from Jesus, you know, how do we adjudicate which inspirational messages we include and which ones we don't include? And if we include too many religious ones, we risk, you know, basically you know, smuggling prayer into these meetings. We got in beyond the content, we got into a couple other discussions that I think are worthy digging into a little bit before we close off this episode and this discussion today. One of the ones I know that you contributed a lot to in this, Olivia, was on the discussion around uh, gender and patriarchy in this. Uh, you know, we have the raw numbers that it was majority male of the people we identified delivering prayers, but, you know, why is that a problem? Um. Oh, that's all I could say about this. Uh, I mean, without attacking too many religions, um, as we know, many do have patriarchal themes within them. It's hard to dispute. Um, and I think when you you have, you know, male representatives of churches coming in to give prayers, not only are you, you know, you're excluding everyone else, that has a different religion or is a non-believer, but you're basically also presenting, you know, a, a, a patriarchal structure, you know, when, when this is a theme that is being presented over and over again. Um, and it's reminding, you know, women in that space that of that structure, you know, even maybe if it's not being overtly said or, you know, that wasn't the, maybe the intention, it, it's still, um, it's still a theme that is presented and maybe it's not something that we're um, totally aware of in the moment, but subconsciously, you know, that is something that is being um, supported, I guess, and to have the government, you know, Canada, who is very uh, liberal in the sense of, you know, women's rights and wanting to support that and as they should be. Um, that's just another element that I feel like in that you know, duty of religious neutrality, we should also, you know, also be making sure that in government spaces, patriarchal themes are also being supported, and that can happen through prayer. And I guess one of the things we tried to explore through here, Teal, is this question of like, well, could the city staff screen for this? Should city staff basically be tasked with saying, all right, we're not going to have the misogynistic religions come and do prayers. We'll just have the friendly liberal ones. Is that okay? Well, th this introduces the, the, the impossible challenge of the state adjudicating you know, what counts as acceptable dogma. And this is actually why separation of religion and government helps everybody, right? So I imagine that most people, I would hope that all people who are religious would also want the state not to be interfering in the internal affairs of their religion and telling them what they can and can't say. And it becomes hugely problematic if, it, if it's like, hey, please, welcome, come to our space, deliver a prayer, but don't quote Leviticus, don't quote Numbers, definitely don't quote Timothy. Um, and so maybe just talk about, like, oh, Song of Solomon can include that, definitely, that's that's too smutty for this uh, this setting. Um, you know, it seems overly restrictive for the state to tell you how to pray. And so this is another reason why separation of religion and government is just a good thing all around for people who are religious and people who are non-religious. One, one of the things I will say is that it's really hard to do it the other way, which is to try to get proper representation. Uh, so Scotland opens their um, their legislature with an invocation, and they have a rotation of people, and they try to make it reflect the diversity of Scotland. And their goal is to have it reflect the religious diversity. So sometimes they'll have someone deliver a prayer, a Christian prayer, a, a Muslim prayer. Sometimes they'll have someone from a secular humanist association give an invocation. But when you look at the statistics and break them down, what you still see is they're disproportionately delivered by men. And that tends to be because if you're trying to re represent some religious people in Scotland, and as Olivia was saying, there's a lot of misogyny within a lot of religious traditions, and there's prohibitions on women serving in the clergy. And as a result, you find that men will be overrepresented. And so it's really just not possible to be representative. Uh, and, and as a result, you just you shouldn't even try. Uh, and even if you were doing so, you're going to exclude some people because you can only be so representative in, in how you're doing your prayers. Yeah, and we've gone through a lot of those challenges as well, especially around religious diversity in this question. And in this paper, we got 
academically published you and I teal uh, arbiters of faith in the journal of secularism and non-religion which was a really fun one to write because we explored the challenge faced by the clerk in the BC legislature of coming up with a list of sample prayers to represent all the religions out there and it offends the ideas of both the like law around this and the practicality like to their credit, you know, the clerk's office did come up with a list because it's not total, you know, it's clearly you could do something, but it's clearly not representative of everyone and every belief. We had submitted as the BC Humanist Association uh, sample prayers or reflections that were, like you mentioned in Saguenay, which would be prescribed, uh, denunciations of theism. It said, you know, we reflect on the fact there's no God. Uh, they didn't include those. Should we sue over that? Maybe we could, but you know it feels petty. But maybe just the whole practice was pointless in the end. Well, this is this is really the interesting thing, right? You know, I've had some people say to me, "Oh, well, having a prayer just reflects all religious faiths." No, you know, having a prayer that says Jesus is God and let's praise Him is necessarily negating other faith traditions that don't recognize that deity, right? And it's also excluding the non-religious. So yeah, you just you can't do it. One of the things we talked about in that paper and was the you know the challenge of the state saying, okay, we've got two prayers here. They're both from the, the local Pentecostal church. One of them has a spelling error in it. Okay, well, we can throw that one out. Well, we have another prayer from the Pentecostals, and they're, they're both the same insofar as, like, they're both prayers. Which one do we pick? And the state doesn't have any basis for picking one over the other. And as soon as it starts to come up with a reason, it's violating, you know, deeply held legal principles. And it's just not practical as well. So, yeah, there's practical and legal challenges to including prayer and council meetings and it's just best not to even go there. I guess I'll just have our discussion kind of close with, a, let's let's call it a teaser, because I'm cognizant that we've already spent an hour talking about this, but we've been growing the amount we've written on Indigenous content, because inevitably when we look at prayers at these meetings, we're looking at the start of meetings, and municipalities start, have started to do a lot more things. A lot we have found particularly here in BC, but we're seeing the practice across the country, are including uh, Indigenous territorial welcomes. And especially at inaugural meetings, they're often inviting elders to do something at the start. Uh, maybe, Olivia, you could talk a little bit about what we found around these kinds of practices. You know, I don't have the numbers in our notes, but just like qualitatively, what is happening out there? Yeah, so... I mean, many land acknowledgements. I mean, we'd like to see more. Um, I'll just say that um, with the numbers that we found, I, I think that uh, for, for prayers, I think there could be at least a matched number of territorial acknowledgements. Um, but aside from that, there were smudgings, um, songs, a lot of like cultural traditions of welcoming, um, traditional welcomes, I think were a lot as well, a lot of them were called. Um, they, and sometimes it wasn't even labeled something specifically, but they just had a representative representative of the community come in and just say, you know, thank you for having us here. Um, we're happy to be working with you in the future, which I think is good as well. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, to restate what I said before, it would be good to see the numbers be a lot higher in that regard. Um, and also, we didn't check those as thoroughly as we checked prayers. So to give them some credit, there may have been some that we missed too. So um, that's definitely something for future research that we'll look into more thoroughly, I think, um, as you know, the theme of reconciliation is very, very important to look into. One of the challenges we run into when looking at these kinds of indigenous um, elements in in meetings is they're often called indigenous blessing or, you know, a traditional welcome may often include what we might consider to be spiritual or religious language. And, you know, as Olivia was saying, like, it, it doesn't seem right to include them in the category of prayer. So a traditional welcome, you know, obviously every uh, indigenous community is going to have its own, its own take on a, a traditional welcome, if they have them at all. But a traditional welcome is not just, say, an invocation of, that may have spiritual elements. It's also a, a political and a diplomatic protocol. Like these are protocols that you would adopt if you were greeting people who were visiting you. And so to call them religious and prayers doesn't seem right. And I know, Ian, you've written about this 
um, in a couple of our papers where you know it, it seems like we're trying to describe these practices as religion because we have a pre-existing definition of religion that's based on say you know Abrahamic religions um, whereas it doesn't seem right to to describe them as such and then not only that but like even if we could describe these as prayers there's a strong case to be made that there may still be a role for them in the process of reconciliation I know that was something new that we added to this report and this is a, a conversation for another day in a lot more depth but you know, the evolving role and the importance of continuing the process of reconciliation means including Indigenous content in our meetings. And you can't be prescriptive in that respect. You can't say, hey, welcome to our meeting. Please give a traditional welcome. But, you know, that traditional welcome, you mention a spiritual thing. Can you just cut that out? Like, it, that would be also a problem with colonialism. <laughs> so um, we recognize that that's, that's, that's an interesting conversation that we have to have as a society moving forward as we continue in the process of reconciliation. Well, and even just blurring the lines even more, you get examples like in uh, Niebing, where they invited a local elder, Victor Peltier of the Fort Williams First Nation, to deliver a, quote, prayer and smudge blessing ceremony. Uh, and the notes in the minutes say that he blessed himself, then asked for blessing for the council on its term, and after the prayers, a smudging purification ceremony took place. We don't have video of this, so we don't know exactly what happened. But... What we do know is that Elder Peltier is a deacon of the local Catholic parish. And, you know, this is easily understood within the context of colonialism and the fact of residential schools were largely run by Catholic and United Church ministers. And so a lot of Indigenous people grew up steeped in Christianity. And it's unsurprising that it's stuck in many cases or that it's gotten blended together. But then you kind of have this situation where you go, all right, this seems like it's partially a Catholic, a Catholic prayer, but also it's definitely, there's an indigenous element to there. We opted to exclude that one as a prayer and kept it within the category of First Nation ceremonies and indigenous ceremonies, but it's fuzzy. Uh, and I think, you know, there's definitely other situations, like I mentioned New Market or this idea of like, what if you don't, you know, differentiate clearly in your agenda between like are you putting the indigenous people on the same stage as the you know religious representatives you're bringing or are you kind of recognizing that there is a unique relationship between colonial governments and indigenous governments um, so there's a lot in this report there's a lot we've written in our past reports decolonizing legislative prayer being the big one but here we really get into this question around substantive equality that you were touching on teal the idea of not quite affirmative action, but needing to move forward beyond just recognizing that formal equality, the idea that we treat everyone the same, doesn't always reflect the historical context that is so critical here. And the historical context and present context of relations between colonial governments and indigenous peoples in this country uh, matter. And so we don't have a firm conclusion on where things need to go or should go. That's definitely not even our role necessarily, but there's a lot more writing. We found a really fascinating paper by uh, Carlos uh, Colorado that we cite a couple of times in here. Uh, most boldly, he goes on to say, decolonizing the secular at its most radical level may ultimately mean a rejection of secularism altogether and the champion of indigenous models of public life and deliberation to engage cultural and religious difference. Probably a little farther than we or most of our members would want to go, but he does kind of roll back in his paper and structure out what a decolonized secularism is or could be and how it could incorporate reconciliation and the calls to action to try to make sure that we're not using secularism effectively as a new tool of colonialism but there's so much more we could talk about in that well and you make this distinction in some of our publications even which is you know this there's, there really does seem to be a difference between a proselytizing religion delivering a prayer at a council meeting and a performance and i think you know one of the things that they do here in victoria is they were opening council meetings with an art performance they invite a local piano player to you know play the piano while people are gathering and or a local, they have a poet laureate, or they had a poet laureate who would deliver a poem at the beginning of each meeting, um, before the meeting starts, just as sort of a celebration of local art and culture. And so this is, that is not to say that the Indigenous content is just art and culture in the same context, but, you know, it's really A, important that you treat them as separate categories, and B, like, we explore how our meetings are structured, 
right? Like the whole Westminster model that's replicated at the municipal level, the whole way of doing governance may itself be a form uh, holdover from colonialism. Uh, as someone who loves Robert's rules and structured meetings, I, I find that, you know, that's going to be a very interesting conversation moving forward. But the way that we do business may be based, it, it was, you know, our procedures and policies were developed in a system that was misogynistic, that was discriminatory, that was colonial, that was racist. And so we need to be looking at those critically to try to improve them, to make them more inclusive, more welcoming, more accommodating of all folks. Lots more to discuss there going forward and to think about what what other kinds of things, though, are you excited to look at as we continue our research along these angles? Or what would you even encourage other people to look at, Olivia, if they're so interested in municipal prayers? Um, yeah, I think one of our ideas that was kind of interesting is to, and I know we, we did put up something geographical, though, to look into it in more depth is um, kind of the idea of being able to find a so-called Bible Belt. Um, I know that's talked about a lot in the States, um, but that hasn't really ever fully been I think studied here in, in terms of um, like across Canada, but Ontario specifically, um, and even when you do look at the Matthew maybe and I you can see there is, <laughs> there is something happening there. So I think it would be interesting for someone to look into or for us to look into in the future, um, that on a more geographical level where a concentration of more the religious prayers are happening or just prayers in general. There's something else too, Ian, which I wanted to build on, which is looking at how things have changed over time. So, you know, our study looked at prayer in municipal council meetings after Saguenay, and it kind of ended around uh, 2021 when we finished our data gathering. We were doing some uh, fact, you know, some double checking in the last few months as well. But Ontario has had another round of municipal elections. And so there's been a new round of inaugural meetings that happened in the last few months. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing, and I hope to be doing um, very soon, is looking at um, updating our data set to look at what happened to the most recent round of inaugurals. And that will allow us to see, A, how effective our advocacy was. We did write to all the municipalities that had prayers and remind them that they shouldn't be doing that this time around. And um, it'll also allow um, us to sort of gauge the changes over time in Indigenous content, moments of silence, and other things along those lines. So I think one thing that's really important is to look at how this has changed, because you know, as we noted, you have Saguenay, you have letters, you have letters from us, you have letters from provincial bodies that are all urging municipalities to make their council meetings more welcome. And the hope is that this change happens over time. So I'm looking forward to seeing those results. And, and this is also, again, like one of the benefits that people support for the BC Humanist provides. Um, this is another, you know, not shameless plug, but a, you know, a demonstration of how effective our advocacy has been. In British Columbia, we've been successful in removing prayer from over 20, well, from 20 municipal council meetings, and our hope is that we can replicate that in Ontario as well. And we're also going to be continuing our study across the country. So we've been looking at legislative prayer. We now have reports on British Columbia, Manitoba, and Ontario. We have data for Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Maritimes. The north, the data was a bit more patchy. Um, in Quebec, we didn't have quite as much data. Uh, we found the top 50 municipalities by population. We didn't find any with prayer, so that study might be a bit thinner. Um, but we're looking at this across the country because it's important that everyone in Canada have access to municipal council meetings that don't exclude them based on their beliefs. And when we look at provincial and federal legislatures, things get a little bit more dicey. We're not here to talk about that in total, but we've seen some changes over time. Nova Scotia, I think, was the one that most recently ended the practice of opening their legislature with prayers, but there's still more work to do here in British Columbia and looking at other provinces and the federal government. We've tried to petition last year for MPs to take seriously the prayer at the House of Commons. And credit to the Bloc Québécois for speaking out several times this past year about that, whether it was for politically motivated wedge issue reasons or, you know, a pure love of secularism. It didn't matter in the end as long as it could move forward, but it it still needs you to write to your MPs. So lots more work to do. Maybe just final takeaways from the report or the entire process or what even was like your most favorite aspect of working on this? Uh, Olivia, I'll let you go first. I mean, biggest takeaway, I wish we would find less. <laughs> I suppose that would definitely make our work a little bit easier. Um, and it would be nice to know that people are following the constitution. Um, but also the more that we do find it just fuels for me, that's why this is so important. Um, and it also highlights the fact that 
some body, whether it's government or I don't know, some regulating body needs to be checking, you know, compliance with the constitution. Like, I mean, we're a small organization and it's good that we're doing this work, but it would be nice if the government would also, you know, maybe be doing something about the fact that there are a lot of municipalities in Ontario and across the country that are not following the constitution. For me, I, I, I would, I would agree with what Olivia was saying, you know, that there's a lot of work to be done. I think it, to me, the most exciting thing is that we're making a difference. You know, our, we're not just doing research in an ivory tower. The BCHA's research team is action oriented and our work is being used for activism and to make the world a more you know, secular, more equal, more inclusive space. And I think that's really critical. I was recently elected to a city council, so now I have to sit through these council meetings and uh, wait, I don't have to, I, I get to sit through these council meetings and I, it really underscores to me the, to me, the importance of making these meetings inclusive. Uh, we have say a public hearing. We had one the other night that went till midnight. It was like a five hour public hearing and people get up to the microphone and a significant number of them will say stuff like, I'm really nervous. And you can see them actively being nervous. This might be the only time they talk to a council meeting. You know, there's a, water issue with their neighbor's lawn or they're upset about the duplex that's going in down the street on such and such a street uh, and this, so this person has taken time out of their day to come to council to sit in front of a microphone it's imposing there's you know a mayor with a, a row of councillors sitting in front of them and it's really important that we make them feel welcome in that space otherwise they're not likely to come and share their views and as um, city councillors it's critical that we hear those views. And so I think this really is important work that we're doing. And um, it actually makes me really happy that we're having an impact and making the world more inclusive and more secular. Yeah, and for me, I'm just really happy with how much we were able to add to our literature on this subject in this report. This was such a massive detailed discussion. We covered so much ground and new ground at that. So we have a lot to build on. We don't have to repeat everything again and we can just refer back but i thought it was a really meaty discussion we covered a lot it's unfortunate that we had so much to break into as olivia was saying but we're making progress so go find the whole report it's at bchumanist.ca throw us a couple bucks before the end of the year to help keep our work going to keep our lights on to keep our staff employed but otherwise enjoy the benefits of secularism at this year-end time. <laughs>